can think and feel and love and how much more can God above according to his own God himself became as we All right, thank you, Matt and Josie. Thank you, Upper Columbia Academy. You pay attention over there. (laughs) You back there, too. All right, morning, everyone. Have you had a good day? Just getting started? All right, I'm looking forward to our presentation this morning because it it, it derives, it, it flows very nicely, very naturally from the very thing that Matt and Josie were just singing. And that is this word or this name, Emmanuel. 
In the story of Matthew, one of the, an angel appears to Mary and says, you're going to call this guy's name Emmanuel, right? And uh, the name literally means God with us. And uh, yet the problem is, for many of us, we thought that God would have been with us, that he would have returned to earth long before this. And uh, we look at our watches and we can scarcely believe what's on there. 2014, and we look in the mirrors and we can scarcely believe, right? We thought, what are we still doing here, right? And we're going to talk today about the return of the king. When will Emmanuel not just be an idea or a beautiful song, but when will it be reality? As Paul says, now we see through a glass darkly, but then we'll see. Do you remember what he said? We'll see, what was that? Face to face. Now I know in part, but then I'll know just like I am known. Look at the screen here. We've been talking about the fact that God commits himself to what? God commits himself to the process. And that process is introduced to us right in the opening bit of Scripture, the front door of Scripture, Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3. And for those of you that are new here, we have some new faces. I just want to let you know that what we've been sort of discovering here is that the whole of Scripture can be reduced to three basic ideas, right? The whole of Scripture, hundreds of chapters and thousands of verses and dozens of books, all of it can be reduced to three basic ideas. And what are those ideas, everyone? Creation, conflict, and covenant. Very good. Creation, conflict, and covenant. And we've been spending some time looking at conflict. And uh, last night we spent some time looking at uh, the creation account. And tonight when we come back, we're going to wrap it up by looking at covenant. And, uh, but today we're going to talk about the return of the king and when is it that Jesus will return? And the question on the tip of many of our tongues is, why has it taken so long? W- what are we still doing here in 2014? And maybe the follow-up question would be, how much longer will it be? Right? Now, I stand before you today as a Seventh-day Adventist. Uh, I became a Seventh-day Adventist when I became a Christian. So as a follower of Jesus, when I was baptized June 6, 1996, Um, The church that I became a member of was the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and I've enjoyed my time here. I love it here. I feel at home here. But there is certainly a sense among the Seventh-day Adventists that I meet that we're living on borrowed time, right? Whether you're a a Seventh-day Adventist here this morning or not is is not really the point. The point is is that there's an almost sense that what are we still doing here, right? Uh, Why are we, if Jesus died on the cross 2,000 years ago, Why are we still here today? What are we waiting for? Isn't Jesus supposed to return? And isn't he supposed to return soon? Right? You can get an amen out of a Seventh-day Adventist congregation so easily. Right? It's just as easy as can be. You just say, Jesus is coming soon. Amen? And they'll say, amen. Right? And a great many of them aren't really sure, but they're going to say amen. I mean, they think they're supposed to say amen, but, but many of us are looking and saying, why Is it taking so long? What gives? Jesus died on the cross some 2,000 years ago, and yet here we are. When will Emmanuel be a reality and not just an idea that we sing about and that sounds pretty? Well, all the way back in Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3, we've mentioned that those are really, that's the whole story of scriptures encapsulated in those three chapters, Genesis 1, 2, and 3. In those three chapters, we have creation, creation, conflict, and covenant. And uh, as I remarked to you before, one of my um, friends and one of the brightest uh, minds that I know, one of the brightest biblical minds that I know, a man by the name of Dr. Richard Davidson, has suggested that the entire Bible, right, other than Genesis 1, 2, and 3, is basically commentary on those chapters. That the story is contained right there. Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3. And the rest of, of Scripture, from Genesis chapter 4 to Revelation chapter 22, the whole of Scripture in some way, from some perspective, in some shape or form, is commentary on that original passage. This morning we're talking about the return of the king. When will Jesus return, as Revelation says he will, as king of kings and lord of lords? And why, pray tell, is it taking so long? Well, we're going to go back to Genesis chapter 3 and remind ourselves of this verse. Adam and Eve have just partaken of the forbidden fruit, the fruit that God had said that in the day you eat of it, you will surely die. They have hid, they've experienced that that, uh, uh, emotional landscape that we discussed that God never intended them to experience, shame and guilt and blaming and fear and hiding, all of that built around the great principle of self-preservation, right? 
about the preservation of self. Me, selfishness has now taken the place of love. And in the midst of the garden there, there's, there's three parties that are standing before God. There's Adam, there's Eve, and there's the serpent. And to Adam, God asks a series of questions. Where are you? Who told you that you were naked? What have you done? To Eve, he asks a single question. What is this that you have done? But then he turns his attention to the serpent and he asks no questions because there were no questions to be asked. He's dealing here with what the book of Revelation calls that old, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, the ancient serpent. Well, that is a reference back to the very passage that we're in here in Genesis chapter 3. And in that conversation where God is not inquiring of the serpent, he is speaking declaratively to the serpent. He says these words in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. And I will put enmity or hostility. I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He, this hostility now, this enmity now is now, is now it's personified. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Right here in the outset of Scripture, before we, get, before we ever get to the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we have, the, we have the nascent Gospel story, the beginnings of the Gospel story, that a deliverance will come, that a deliverer will come, and in the process of deliverance, the serpent who seems to have gained a provisional victory, certainly has it in the garden, that his head will ultimately be crushed, but in the process of his head being crushed, he will strike the heel of the victor. He will strike the heel of the one who is crushing his own head. I live in Australia, as you know. It's a beautiful place. And uh, yet, it's a really deadly place. If you want to watch a really funny video, you can go on YouTube and type in Australia Deadly Things. And there's a great video on there that says, Come to Australia, you might accidentally get killed. Your blood is bound to be spilled, right? It's, it's like, it's, it's a great place to live if you want to die because ten, seven of the ten most deadliest snakes live there. Now, I want you to think about this. When it speaks of the serpent striking the heel, right? That's a death wound, right? It's, it's not just a mild wound, it's a death wound because any serpent that you would, of which you would be legitimately afraid would be a poisonous serpent. Now, in just a few verses later, we're actually introduced to the idea that this will require death. It will be not only a wounded deliverer, but the deliverer in the process of delivering will himself be wounded to death. And what happens in just a few verses later, Genesis chapter 3, verse 21, Adam and Eve had instinctively, had intuitively made themselves garments. They sensed the need uh, of, of covering themselves. They knew that they were vulnerable and, and, and they, they had a, an, a sense, I need to cover. And God says, you're right, you're onto something there. You will need to be covered. Nakedness now becomes a symbol, not of innocence, which it was in Genesis chapter 2, verse 25. They were naked and they were not ashamed. Now, for the rest of Scripture, nakedness becomes a symbol of our total bareness, our total transparency, our total vulnerability before God, and thus a symbol of shame. It's a remarkable thing. From Genesis chapter 2 to Genesis chapter 3, nakedness symbolically changes from a symbol of innocence to a symbol of shame and of guilt, and God acquiesces to this basic idea of covering. Yes, Adam, yes, Eve, you will need to be covered, but you will not be covered with leaves. Verse 21 says, the Lord God made garments of, what is that word there? Garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. Let me just translate that very simply here, and I want to remind you, we're in Genesis chapter 3. We're not in Matthew or Mark or Luke or John or the book of Romans. We're in Genesis chapter 3, and God is saying, you will be clothed with innocence, but it will require death. Did you get that? You will be clothed. There will be an innocence. There will be a covering of your shame, of your guilt, and of your sinfulness. Yes, that will happen, but it will require death. But the message is not your death. It will require the death of another, the very thing that he had said just verses before, that the deliverer will come. He will bring hostility between you and the, and the, the offspring, the descendants of the woman, right? But in the process of you crushing his head, of, of your head being crushed, you will wound the deliverer 
to the point of death. That's the place you're most likely to get bitten by a snake. You're not going to get bitten on the chin by a snake unless you're crawling around in your stomach through the bush. <laughs> Inadvisable. Just FYI, a few survival skills here, right? No, as a rule, if you're walking, right, you're, you will be bit on the leg, right? And so the woundedness that will come will result, according to Genesis 3.21, in the death of the deliverer. Now, as we leave Genesis chapters 1 to 3, we have a sense that this process will take, what is that word? That this process will take time, and it will be, what are the other two words there? Quite involved. In other words, have you ever spilled milk at the, at the table? You know, have your kids ever spilled milk or spilled orange juice on your table? What did you do? I mean, I mean after you punished them. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding, of course. <laughs> What did you do? When somebody spills milk, what do you do? Come on, give me, the, give, me, give me some love here. What do you do? You wipe it up. It's simple. Simple problem, simple solution, right? Spill the milk, wipe it up. Apparently, what's taken place here in the garden, what's taken place in Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3, Moses is writing so that you can know this is not spilled milk. It's not as though God could have just come down and said, oh, look at this mess that you've made. No problem. Wipes it up and all is good. Okay, carry on. Carry on. No. Moses is clearly communicating to us that God made it abundantly clear to Adam and Eve, hey, we have a problem. We have a major problem. I wasn't just whistling Dixie when I said to you, Adam, in the day that you eat of that tree, you will surely, what was the word? You will surely die. Now notice he didn't say, Adam, in the day that you eat of that tree, I'm going to kill you. And I asked you the question the other day, is there a difference between I will kill you and you will die? Yes, I will kill you is active. God's taking an active, almost punitive role, but you will die. God is now taking not a punitive role, but a protective role. Hey, stay away from that tree. In the same way that you as a parent might say to your child, hey, don't put the screwdriver or the, 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 the knife into the, into the light socket. You're not saying in the day that you do that, I'm going to kill you, though you might be inclined to do something like that. You're saying in the day that you do that, you could die. God here is not primarily punitive. He's protective. He's shielding them from something. And so when they have partaken of the forbidden fruit and they have effectively become loyal to God's enemy, that's what's taken place. This isn't spilled milk. There's an accusation that's been levied against God's character. There's an accusation that's been levied against his conduct. There's an accusation by extension that's been levied against his government. And God comes into the garden not with a great big cosmic dish rag to wipe up the little spilled milk of sin. God says, ooh, this will be more involved than you could possibly imagine. Let me give you a little glimpse of what this is going to look like. I will put hostility between you seemingly friendly compatriots. Your offspring and the, the, the serpent will eventually come to the point of hostility and antipathy. But it will require a woundedness on the part of the deliverer. A woundedness that will result in, in the death of the deliverer. Let me illustrate that. He calls two two. We don't know what they were. Lambs, perhaps? Right? It would take Adam and Eve were large. Lambs are small. It would have taken a number. He, he calls innocent, beautiful, happy creatures to himself. They would have been slain to the horror of Adam and Eve. And then garments, would have bloody garments would have been made in their presence and then placed on them. If Adam and Eve had any kind of a takeaway... Let your mind go back to that scene. It wouldn't have been quick. It's not spilled milk. It's not wipe, wiping up the orange juice. If they would have had any sense, they would have been like, ooh. This is a little bigger than we thought it would be. When we leave Genesis chapters 1 to 3, we, are, we, are, we leave with the, with the unmistakable sense that this process will take time and that it will be quite involved. Let me just illustrate that for you. You will recall that Genesis is here, Revelation is there. This is the front door, that's the back door, right? So we're going to move now through the story of Genesis written by Moses. We go all the way through the Old Testament. Somewhere about here, we encounter the Gospel of Matthew. We go through Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. Okay, let me just give you a feel for where we're at. We're 4,000 years after that event, give or take. 
Okay, we're, we're hundreds of years, centuries upon centuries upon centuries upon centuries after the event that we just described in Genesis chapter 3. And Paul, the Apostle Paul, right? Adam doesn't know who Paul is. Adam, Eve don't, doesn't know who Paul is. They have no idea that 4,000 years later someone's going to write this in a letter to a place called Rome. Rome's, Romans chapter 16, verse 20. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. But, but, but what? 4,000 years later, it's going to happen soon. 4,000 years later, he will soon be crushed under your feet. Well, this is anything but soon. Are you getting a feel for that? I mean, 4,000 years later, he's saying that event, the consummation of the crushing of the serpent that was announced back in Genesis 3, is yet future. This is a big event. This is an involved event. This isn't something that just happens in a moment. Now, we need to spend about five minutes, maybe six minutes of review here. Just brief review to catch everybody up to speed and to remind ourselves where we're at. When we get down to the back door of Scripture, when we get down here to the book of Revelation, and Scripture is coming to its grand and profound climax, right? We come to this place in Revelation chapter 12. We've read this before, but we're reviewing now. Just a brief bit of review before we launch back into picking up the story about the return of the king. We encounter this verse in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. We've read it numerous times before. We're going to read it again because it has echoes. It has the very nucleus, the very embryo of Genesis chapter 3 is right here. So that great dragon was cast out. Who is that? That what? Serpent of old. What's he called? He's called the devil and Satan or Satan, the enemy, the accuser, the adversary, the opponent who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. Why? For the accuser of our brethren has been what? Cast down. Four times he says it. He's been cast down. He's been cast down. He's been cast down. He's been cast down. And we ask the question. It's a very important question to understand. How is the accuser cast down? By what means is the accusation silenced? Now this is hugely significant. Let's switch from the spilled milk metaphor to the, to, the, to the myth of redemptive violence metaphor that we talked about last night, or maybe it was two nights ago, right? All superhero movies, all action and adventure movies are built around this basic idea of what's called the myth of redemptive violence, right? A wrong has been committed. Somebody has been murdered. Somebody has been killed. Somebody's going to blow up the world with a nuclear bomb or whatever it might be. Some terrible act of violence is going to take place. Oh no, what's going to happen? What, what? And every script s tells the same story. Variations on a theme. Change the actors. Change the costumes. Change the city. Make it Tokyo instead of New York. Make it New York instead of Chicago. What a, change the story. Maybe it's a Superman or maybe it's just some well-trained Navy SEAL type figure. Whatever it is, the story is the same. Some superhuman hero guy shows up and with violence, he saves the day. The myth of redemptive violence. The idea that force can be overcome with force. That violence can be overcome with more violence. That strength can be overcome with more strength. Well, if... if the history of the world teaches us anything, and if the history of our own experience teaches us anything, it's that there's always going to be someone else. There will always 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 be someone else. This idea that we can experience deliverance or salvation or whatever it is Batman, Spider-Man, Superman, and Iron Man promise to give us, that that can happen through a violent act fundamentally misses the point of the reality that we know in which we're living. By the way, I'll just say this, and it's not a political statement, it's a theological statement. There are those of us that think, oh no, it's the American military that will eventually bring a sort of deliverance and a peace to the world. Let me tell you, if you believe that, you are sorely mistaken. Because the Bible still says, he that lives by the sword, what happens to him? He dies by the sword. He that leads into captivity, what happens to him? He goes into captivity, and just to make it a little more modern, not only does he that lives by the sword die by the sword, he that lives by the drone dies by the drone. He that lives by night vision goggles dies by night vision goggles. The idea that we are somehow going to be finally and ultimately delivered in some sense by violence is fundamentally flawed. Now this does not imply that there are not circumstances in which we have to 
defend ourselves or defend those that are around us or create a situation where we don't allow somebody to run roughshod over the poor. I understand that. But these are all consequences of living on a broken planet. What the movies are telling us is that ultimately, and what even some well-meaning but ultimately misguided politicians and military leaders, and remember, I told you my dad spent 36 years in the American military. I know about the American military. But some would have us believe that if we could just get strong enough and more powerful enough, then we could bring peace to the earth. Peace through violence. Right? We tried that with the whole nuclear weapon thing. But then Russia got their nukes, and we got more. And no, we have more than you. No, we have more than you. No, we have more than you. Nanny, nanny, boo, boo. Well, wait a minute. We have enough to blow the world up hundreds of times over. And who's winning? I'm confused about who's winning this. And now we're in a great big pickle because the absolute escalation of nuclear warfare has created a situation where, where some of these older weapons and older bombs could fall into the wrong hands. And so the United States and, and other nations that are in possession of nuclear weapons are collectively scratching their head and saying, maybe, maybe we should de-escalate. Maybe we should disarm. That's a great story I wasn't planning on telling him to tell you now. A guy by the name of Richard Gatling invented a gun called the Gatling gun. And he, he was showing his, his, his invention, his machine, to a number of, of, at that time, this is back in the 1800s, a number of people, maybe it was 1700s, no, it would have been 18, a number of people that, that uh, were arms manufacturers, Winchester rifles and Remington and others, had come to sort of see this, this gun that could allegedly fire multiple rounds in a second, right? And he gave a demonstration. Right? As the story goes, Gatling got his gun all fired up, and he went, he turned the handle. You might have seen those old pictures of the Gatling gun. And you could just shoot by just turning a handle. And, and uh, one of the, as the story goes, is this, as the, uh, he'd already filed his patent with the U.S. Patent Office. He'd received it, and now he was trying to say, okay, who wants to buy the technology? And one of the, the prospective investors turned to him and said, but Mr. Gatling, won't this weapon make war all the more terrible? His response was priceless. And it was a fundamental misunderstanding of human nature. He said, oh no, sir, this gun will make war impossible. His thinking was, if we could make a weapon so efficient, so successful at killing people, that it's so easy to just mow people down, people will come to their senses and they'll stop doing it. Because in ancient times, if you wanted to kill somebody, you had to get really close, right? You had to get sword close. You had to get knife close. You had to get spear close. And it was messy and difficult. And your own life was threatened. And it was problematic to try and kill somebody. Eh, and they're trying to kill you. And it was, it was messy. So when a gun was invented, this was a game changer. But when, a <laughs> when that's invented, well, now war becomes impossible. Yeah. Within 150 years, we have the atom bomb. That's the world we live in. Right? We live in a world where we have, many of us, too many of us, unwittingly bought into the idea that if we can just get strong enough and if we can be more violent than somebody else, eventually we will be delivered. And all of the superhero movies and all of the action movies are feeding in to this basic idea of the myth of redemptive violence. God could have just showed up in the garden and been like, what, are you kidding? He could have drop-kicked Lucifer out of existence and all would have been fine and good, except that, as we've already mentioned, it's easier to kill people than ideas. And Lucifer's idea would not have lost basic traction. It would have gained. His influence would have increased. So how will this happen? How will the accuser be cast down? By what means is the accusation to be silenced? And the answer is by a totally different kind of power. A power of vulnerability, a power of suffering, a power of love, and the power of dying for someone else. A radical commitment to a totally different way of doing battle. Jesus is the Lamb. That's the phrase, that's the term that's used for him over and over again in the writings of both Revelation and John. The Lamb, the Lamb, the Lamb, the Lamb, the Lamb. And I love what Richard Bachman says in his theology of the book of Revelation. When the slaughtered Lamb is seen in the midst of the throne in, in heaven, in Revelation chapter 5 or 6, the meaning is that, listen to this carefully, Christ's sacrificial death belongs to the way that God is ruling the world. Beloved, I want this to settle in right now the most powerful being in the universe, the being that 
that would be completely unaffected by smart bombs and nuclear bombs and Superman, Iron Man, Batman, or Spider-Man, if they existed, the most powerful being in the universe is hanging on a tree, bleeding and dying for others. And in the midst of that, in some marvelous paradox of self-sacrifice, he is victorious. And that person, with all of his attendant humility and mercy and grace and compassion and love, is seated on the throne of the universe. Can somebody say amen? I'm telling you right now, there is no better good news. I just tweeted this the other day. There is no better good news imaginable than the idea that the character of the person who is the most powerful person in the universe is a lamb. There is a lamb, it says in Revelation chapter 5 or 6, seated on the throne of the universe. Okay, that's our brief review. Come with me now to a, one of the weirdest texts in the whole Bible. In fact, this text is so weird. It's in Revelation chapter 20. This text is so weird that there are well-meaning but, but misguided scholars that think that this text is actually a mistake. Or at least this word is a mistake. Come with me to one of the most difficult to believe verses in all of the Bible. Revelation chapter 20. What, what, what chapter are we going to, everyone? Revelation chapter 20. We've gone through the front door, right? This whole beautiful story of creation, conflict, and covenant. We've come to the, to the birth of Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, we've moved our way through the Gospels, and we find ourselves now at the back door, knocking on the back door. And when we come in the back door, we encounter Revelation 21 and 22, a perfect God in perfect communion with a perfect people in a perfect environment. But the chapter just before that, Revelation chapter 20, is the final demise of the Satan, the final demise of the enemy. But this demise is described in very difficult to understand terms, unusual terms, I mean, you think about the amount of time that's transpired from Genesis chapter 3, where we're introduced to that old serpent called the devil and Satan, all the way down here. Here comes his final demise, and as his demise is preparing, it's, it's announced to us in symbolic language, and there's a particular verse and a particular word that, that we have to understand, and if we fail to understand this word, we fail to understand the whole point. Well-meaning scholars have looked at this word and said that's the wrong word. We don't know what John was thinking. Maybe it was a later scribe that inserted that word. But that word makes no sense. In fact, it makes perfect sense, given what we're going to understand today. Revelation chapter 20, verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down. This is the Bible drawing to its grand and beautiful climax. I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having a key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. This has actually occurred earlier, back in Revelation chapter 9. We don't have time to get into that. He laid hold of the dragon. There it is. That serpent of old who was called the devil and Satan, that's an immediate connection to Genesis chapter 3. He's letting you know Genesis 3 is finally coming to pass. He bound him for a thousand years. He incarcerated him. He stuck him away. And he cast him into the bottomless pit. He shut him up. I like that verse. He shut him up. And he set a seal on him that he should deceive the nations no more. Now just hold on to that. We're going to come back to verse 3 in just a second. Notice that he will deceive no more. He will what? Deceive. You remind me, what's the first thing that we're told about the serpent back here in Genesis chapter 3? What was the first thing we're told about him? He's cunning. He's subtle. He's deceptive. You're in Revelation chapter 20. Look at verse 8, or look at verse 7. Now when the thousand years will have been expired, Satan will be released from his prison. What? What? Let me read that again. Satan will be released. Satan will be released from his prison. Okay, we'll come back to that. I'm already confused. Verse 8, and he will go out to deceive. What does he do? He goes out to deceive. Jump down to verse 10. The devil who, what's the word? Deceive them. Three times in Revelation chapter 20, John wants you to know the point. He's a deceiver. He's a deceiver. He's a deceiver. He's the Satan. He's the accuser. And this is the description of the final demise of the accuser. Jump back now to verse 3. We, we left off just after the word deceive. Jump back up there now so that he should deceive the nations no more until the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he, what does your Bible say? He must be released for a little while. He what? 
This is the word that scholars look at, not all scholars, but many, particularly those of a more liberal persuasion. They look and they say, that's the wrong word. There's no, in what sense would it be required? In what sense is, is there a necessity? Why must he be released? What a strange thing. Look at the, the, the graphic here on the screen. Basically, what we have for thousands of years is Satan's career of accusation and deception, right? Deception, 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 deception. Then we come down to Revelation chapter 20, the story of the final demise of the accuser, of the enemy, and he is detained for a period of a thousand years. And you think, finally, we got rid of that guy. But then the scripture says he has to be let out. He must be released for a little season. So we go from deception for thousands of years to temporary incarceration, and then finally he returns to deception again. What? 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 Why? Why is God dealing with this in this way? And I want to say it again. Because people are easier to kill than ideas. Persons are easier to... See, God is not primarily at war with Satan. I want to say that again. God is not primarily at war with Satan. God is at war with satanic thinking. And satanic thinking can occupy human beings. Because the essence, the, the nucleus, the embryo of satanic thinking is that there's something better than love. That selfishness and self-preservation, that se if I put myself at the center, not only will I be better off, but the world will be better off. And if the world won't be better off if I put myself at the center, then damn them. I will be better off. This is the thinking that God is taking issue with. It's not primarily, and Scripture actually says this, it says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, principles, and powers, and spiritual wickedness in high places. I like to say it this way, if the devil died today, let's say the devil had a heart attack. I don't even know if he has a heart. Well, let's say the devil contracted cancer, skin cancer, and the devil died today. This conflict would continue. Because the conflict is not just with an entity. It's not just with some person. And we give this guy way too much credit. It's with the idea that he released into the air. A way of thinking. A way of doing life. As we've already discussed. He's called the prince of the power of the air. It's atmospheric to think this way. And here's the problem. It's infected us too. It's infected everyone. And so how will this idea. Not just this person. But how will this person and the ideas that he represents be finally and fully vanquished? Can it be done with violence? Well, if it can be done with violence, then why wasn't it done thousands of years before? If all it takes is a good whacking, you know? There's nothing, nothing an M16 can't solve, right? If that's the way that this dilemma could be solved, then why wasn't it? We encounter this weird verse. Satan is deceiving, 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 deceiving. He's detained. And we all say, hallelujah. And then he's let go. And we're like, well, wh hey, God, what? why'd you let him out? I had to. I must release him for a season. You what? I must release him for a season. Well, let me try and make sense out of this. Because it's not easy. Go to the book of Matthew. In the book of Matthew, that's the first book of the New Testament. I've already told you the most useless page in your Bible is that one that separates the Old from the New Testament. Some of you tore it out. I just folded it. I didn't have the courage to tear it out. Felt somehow sacrilegious. It's still there. Jesus tells a story, a parable, in Matthew chapter 13, and I'm going to read it, beginning in verse 24. This story is begins to unlock the why he must be released. Why there was not only a detention, but a release. Matthew chapter 13, verse 24. Another story, another parable he put forth to them, and he said, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat, and then he went away. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared, the weeds. So the servants of the owner said, Hey, sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? Now there is a question behind the question. The question is, hey, where have the tares come from? That's the question. The question behind the question is, did you have something to do with this? Are you responsible? 
Are you in some sense culpable for the appearance of weeds? Because we were under the decided impression that we were sowing wheat. Where'd the weeds come from? Are you responsible for the weeds? You know that that's the question that's being asked because look at the answer in verse 28. Five words. An enemy has done this. He says, no, I, I, I didn't. No, I didn't. It's not me. It's not my doing. An enemy has done that. An enemy has brought the weeds into the, into the wheat. So the servant said, oh, well, then we'll take care of that real quick. Let us go. You want us to go tear up the weeds? Now watch this. But he said, no. What a strange answer. No, no, no. Leave them there. Well, why pray tell? Lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. In those early stages of growth, when the, the weeds and the wheat are just beginning to sprout, before they have reached maturity, before they have reached the, the fullness of what they will become, there is a danger, Jesus says in the story, that in attempting to root up the, the bad, you may actually weed up some of the good. And conversely, you may miss some of the bad. It's too early, he says. We have to wait. We have to what? We have to wait. We have to wait for this process to develop. Verse 30, let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the weeds, bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. What a remarkable story. A story that something bad has happening, happened, something evil has happened. Some, some, the enemy has done something, but the thing that the enemy has done cannot be immediately remedied. Why? It takes time. This is exactly what we encounter back in Genesis chapter 3. Right? In Genesis chapter 3, there's not spilled milk in the garden. God doesn't come in with his cosmic dish rag and start wiping up sin. He says, oh man, this is going to take some time. And it's going to be more involved than you imagine. There will come a day where there will be hostility between you and the offspring of the woman. But it will involve not only your head being crushed, he says to the serpent, but it will involve woundedness and death on the part of the deliverer. See, all the way back in Genesis 3, we were told there's a process. This cannot happen today. And this is really unfortunate for those of us that live in modern times because we want everything and we want it now. Am I wrong or am I right? It's the world we live in. I'll tell you an interesting little etymological story here. Uh, et et etymology has to do with the root of words. And um, the, the, the word for patience, the, gr the root word is, is a Latin word, pati, meaning to suffer. To suffer. And so a doctor would have patience. Right? His patients, well, why do they? Because they're sufferers. People that are suffering, they go to a doctor, right? Patients. But we are called to exercise patience, which basically means suffer. You want it right now, but you have to wait, and you learn from a child, I want it now! And all we've really done is we've just stopped crying about it. But we still suffer when we want something now and we have to what what do we have to do we have to wait. why do i have to wait i want my tax return now right and digital cameras man this is a beautiful thing isn't it there's the picture oh there it is and there it is and there it is. remember back when you used to have to wait you have to turn the film in and then you wait for three weeks and then you get back and realize that you'd underexposed all the film or your finger was in front of the lens the whole time do you remember these days prehistoric the kids don't even know what we're talking about they're like film Yeah, that was back in the days when we lived in caves and <laughs> gathered berries from the ground and took pictures with film. We had to wait. We were sufferers. Come on, I'm poking fun, but you know I'm kind of telling the truth too, aren't I? Impatience. We don't like to wait, but God says, no, 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 this process can't happen like that. There's not only deception, there's detention, and then there's release for further deception. What a remarkable thing. And it's right at this point that we encounter one of the most fascinating words in all, or phrases in all of Scripture, how long. Every one of us in this room, probably, or I, let me be more modest, most of us in this room have wondered, 
how much longer before the king returns? Let me tell you, you are in great company. Look at this. Psalm chapter 74, verse 10. This is actually Psalm, uh, that's the wrong reference. This is actually Psalm 13, verses 1 and 2. How long, O Lord? Will you forget me forever? I love the way the psalmist speaks to God. He doesn't speak like a religious priest. He's not praying some beautiful platitudinous prayer that's going to be shown on a television network. He's being honest with God. He's being real with God. He's being open with God. He's being frustrated with God. He's being angry with God. You ever been frustrated with God? Have you ever been just really just at your wit's end and you felt like you couldn't tell him? He knows it. I love David's transparency. I love his vulnerability. Are you going to forget me forever, he says? How long will you hide your face from me? How long will I take counsel in my soul? That's how long will I be alone? How long will I have sorrow in my heart daily? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? The recurrent refrain is, refrain is, how long, how long? Psalm chapter 74, verse 10. Oh God, how long will the adversary reproach? Will the enemy blaspheme your name forever? How long? Look at this one. Psalm 94, verse 3. Lord, how long will the wicked, how long will the wicked triumph? Right? Psalm 94, verse, uh, look at this one. Da Daniel chapter 8, verse 14. It's actually verse 13. Daniel chapter 8, verse 13. And this is, not, this is not David speaking. This isn't even Daniel speaking. If you can believe this, this is an angel speaking. How long will it take for the vision to be fulfilled? Daniel has seen this horrific, terrible vision of a power making war with God and with his people and with his truth and with his sanctuary and succeeding. Sees this terrible, horrible vision. In fact, it's the longest prophecy in the whole of Bible. 2,300 years. And it's no wonder in the course of the book of Daniel that Daniel faints. How long is this going to last? Oh, just 2,300. 2,300 years? And an angel, it's a part of this vision. The vision, how long will this vision be? This vision to be fulfilled. The vision concerning the daily sacrifice. The rebellion that causes destruction. And the surrender of the sanctuary to be trampled underfoot. This is not a prophet speaking. This is an angel speaking. How long will this rebellion go on? How long will God and his truth and his sanctuary be trampled under? How long? When we come to the end of the book of Daniel, and one said to the man clothed in linen, by the way, that's Jesus in the book of Daniel, just FYI. Someone said to Jesus, who was above the waters of the river, how long is this going to go on? How long will be the fulfillment of these wonders? And when we come down to the book of Revelation, John picks this imagery up, and in the opening of the seal, one of the seals, I think it's the fifth seal or the sixth seal, in the opening of one of those seals there, he sees this, and they, these souls that were described as being under the altar, this is the blood of the martyrs, those who have died unjustly and illegitimately at the hands of persecutors, uh, both religious and irreligious. And the, the, the blood is crying out in the same way that Abel's blood cried out back in the book of Genesis. The blood is crying out, how long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our, blur, our blood on, earth, on those who dwell on the earth? How long? How long? How long? How long? How long? Let me be super straight with you. There are people in this room who are certain that Jesus will come in their lifetime, and many of them are wrong. There are some of you that are sitting here today with gray hair and an achy back who never thought you would see 40, and now you're 70. Tell me I'm wrong right now. Am I right? Yes or no? You know I'm right. When I first became a believer in 1996, I was absolutely persuaded that Jesus was coming within a couple years, max. I remember people would come up to me and say, hey, you think you'll get married? Find yourself a nice Christian girl? And I'd be like, marriage? Who has time for marriage? Jesus is coming soon. And then I saw her, Violetta. True story, following in my father's footsteps, as I told you this morning, I waited a full six weeks before I asked my wife to marry me. And people say, well, that's, that's a little unwise. I tell you, it's working out well for us, 15 years and counting, but here's the point. I was like, I can't wait. If I have any chance of being married to this woman at all, I've got to do it now. 
because Jesus is coming soon. And after we were married, people would come, particularly our father-in-law, who loved to say, Romanian, my, my father-in-law, her father, he'd say, what good? What good is a cherry tree without cherries? <laughs> A.K.A., where are the kids? And I would say to him, Zaharia, who has time for children? Jesus is coming soon. And then one day, you know, it's just weird. She turned up pregnant. Don't know how that happened. The stork showed up and boom, there she was. <laughs> right? And I remember thinking, oh man, what are we going to do when, and, and, and when Jesus returns in the time of our, my, our, our young boys? We'll have to run to the hills with the toddler. And Jesus himself said, woe to those who give suck in those days. So I hope we can get done nursing before the Lord returns. <laughs> and then nine months later, I looked at my wife one day. And I said, sweetheart, I don't know how I know this. I knew the first one, too. I looked at her, and I said, you're pregnant. She said, I'm not pregnant. I said, you're pregnant. She said, I'm not pregnant. I said, okay, let's go get one of those tests. We went and got one of the tests, and test number one, preg pregnant. And she said, yeah, but it's only 98.5%, 98.5%. So we got another, the two-pack, <laughs> pregnant. Third one, pregnant. I said, baby, we're at like 99.6%. You are preggers. I'm telling you. You have a, and she cried all day. And we thought, man, now we have a second one. We'll each have to have a kid under our arm as we flee to the hills at the return of Jesus. And then people would say to us, what? where are you going to send your kids to school? Will you send them to an academy or will you homeschool? Who has time to think about schooling for our children? Jesus is coming soon. And you think I'm being facetious. This is how we thought. And I guarantee there's people in this very room that can identify exactly with what I'm saying. Come on, raise your hands. And now, I blinked and my son was 13. Did that happen to anybody else? How did that happen? How did he go from pooping every day to being 13 in a blink? I mean, in his diapers, and we're cleaning him up, and he's crying in the middle of the night. We're arguing about who has to get up, and I blink, and he's 13. I'm the dad of a teenager. There's people in here who have teenagers and older, and they thought you'd never have children. Tell me I'm wrong. Let me tell you right now, there are people in this room who are just certain that Jesus is still going to come back in their lifetime, and I hope you're right. But many of you are wrong. I might be wrong. There's people in this room that are going to die before Jesus returns. People who were just sure because their parents had told them, Jesus is coming. What word am I going to say next? Soon. Well, don't be too shaken by that because Paul said 2,000 years ago that it's going to happen soon. Apparently, God's version of soon is not like our version of soon. God doesn't apparently suffer when things take a little longer than they'd like. Here's the point. This whole controversy, this whole conflict, listen very carefully, is only going to end once. We're not doing this again. There's no sequel. When it's over, it's over. And however long that period takes, right, whether it's another 10 years or another 50 years or another 100 years, I'm telling you right now, in the cosmic scheme, it's soon. How long, O oh Lord? How long? Sometimes we Christians seem a little too eager for the world to fall apart and to disintegrate into oblivion. The return of the king, and we could go to Matthew chapter 24. I want you to join me there. It's our last passage. Matthew chapter 24. And Matthew chapter 24 is a passage that many of us know really well because it's the signs of the times. The signs of the times. People have been preaching this for a long time. Jesus is coming soon. Here's the signs. I myself have preached this sermon probably a hundred times. Wars and rumors of wars. Famines. Pestilence. Earthquake. Nation rising against nation. The love of many waxing cold. I know the prophetic timelines as good as anyone in this room. I've preached them. I've dedicated my life to preaching them. And I have stood up in venue after venue, in event after event, in church after church, in home after home. And I have told people, Jesus is coming soon. Look at what's taking place in this part of the world. Look at what's taking place. You want to go socially, environmentally. You want to go economically. You want to go governmentally. You want, you want to go morally. Where do you want to look? Right? I've, I have said this. It's happening and it's happening and it's happening. And, it's ha and Jesus is coming soon. The signs of the times, the signs of the times, the signs of the times. And yet, this emphasis on the soon return of Jesus that we're all just as sure is about ready to take place in our own life has actually bred, I think, a bit of an unhealthy relationship that the church has to the world. We're just waiting for God to come and sweep this mess up. Well, I'm actually quite thankful that Jesus didn't come before 1996. I don't know how you feel, but I'm happy about that one since I was baptized on June 6, 1996. 
we should praise God for his patience. There's a little too much eagerness for a whole lot of people to be eternally lost. God longs to come back. But in a remarkable twist of plot, we're not waiting on him. Woo, he didn't see that coming. We're saying to God, the prophets were saying to God, the psalmist was saying to God, Daniel was saying to God, the angel was saying to God, how long? And in a remarkable twist of events, the question is actually misplaced. Because the question is not ours to ask, it's the question that's being asked of us. How long? How long? Because the quintessential sign of the time there in Matthew chapter 24 is this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness unto all nations, and then the end will come. The question is not ours to ask. It's being asked of us. You see, we know Matthew chapter 24 really well. Wars and rumors, wars, famines, pestilences. We know what's going on in the world. But you know what I love is Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25, verse 1, begins with this word, then. It means at that time. 24 is what's happening in the world, but 25, it says, then the kingdom of heaven will be likened. Whoa, we're talking about the church now. The kingdom of heaven will be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five of them were foolish. Those who were foolish took no oil in their lamp, or, or took their lamps with them, but took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels and then with their lamps. Now look at this, verse five. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. I'm so glad it says they all slumbered and slept because if it said nine of them were sleeping, you would be perfectly confident that you were the awake one. <laughs> and so would I. I'd say, man, look at all these sleepy people around me, surrounded by sleepy people. I alone am awake, O oh Lord. Re <laughs> Come on. It says they all were asleep. And notice why they're asleep. Because there's a delay. You see, from Genesis chapter 3 all the way through Scripture, we have been told over and over again, this is involved, this will take a process. It's a process that's so important, so significant, it's not just wiping up spilled milk. God is vanquishing an idea. God is being so open, so vulnerable, so transparent. The lamb that sits on the throne wants to sit on the throne of our hearts how do you vanquish an idea? You overcome it not with an M16. You overcome it with a better idea. And you know what's remarkable? In Matthew chapter, when Matthew 25 wraps up, this is how it ends. Church is asleep. By the way, that's the sign of the times. That's the greatest sign of the times, a sleepy church. The sign that is the most difficult for us to see because many of us in this room are Christians is the preeminent sign. The sleeping church, a sleeping church is itself a sign of the last days. And this is how it ends. Look at this. You want to talk about something? Verse 31, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats and he will set the sheep on the right hand but the goats on the other and then the king will say to those on his right hand, come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. You ready for this? Not because you knew the right answers to the theology quiz. Not because you were a generational Adventist or a generational Christian. Oh, no. Nah. You watch this. Because I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will say, Lord, what? When did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you a drink? W when did we do that? When did we see you a stranger and take you or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison or come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assur Assuredly, I say unto you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did that to me. This, this church at the end of time, what if God is not waiting for the church, for the world to become more godless, but what if he's waiting for the church to become more godly? 
What if the question is not us to him, how long? What if the question is God to us? Hey, folks, Spokane, how long? How long will you believe the lie? How long will you live the lie? How long before the lamb sits on the throne of your heart? How long before satanic thinking is vanquished from your mind? Because Satan is not put out of existence physically until he's put out of existence in our affections. Ah, now we're getting somewhere. What if heaven is waiting not for more injustice, but for more justice? There's just a few too many of us that are just a little too eager for the return of the king. But our picture of the return of the king in some way probably corresponds to that myth of redemptive violence. That when Jesus finally shows up in glory, he'll put an end to it. With pow- and by the way, he is depicted like that in Revelation chapter 9, returning with a sword proceeding out of his mouth and, and uh, uh, king of kings and lord of lords, no question. But you know what's a fascinating thing? Listen to this very carefully. Satan is not finally and fully vanquished in the physical sense, until he is vanquished in our hearts. Until his way of doing things has been shown to be what it is, a grand farce, an experiment in futility that has cost thousands and millions of lives and has cost chiefly and most expensively the life of God himself. The king will return. God is not waiting for things to get worse. He's waiting for things to get better. More loving. More kind. More committed. More lamb-like. More service. More ministry. More feeding. More clothing. More visiting. More, more. Going to heaven and the new earth is not because you answered all the correct answers on the theology quiz. It's not a final exam like that. No. It's having the lamb on the throne of your heart. Vanquishing Satan. Not just from existence, but from yourself. How long? I don't know. But long enough. You've got a decision card there in front of you, and I want to walk you through this. I want you to take a look at that decision card. And the first one says, first of all, go ahead, please, and fill out name, phone, fill out all the the necessary information, please. But you'll notice the first one says, Jesus is my king, and I long to see him face to face. Jesus is my king. Wow, that's a radical idea. If Jesus is your king, then you are his subject. Now, some of us are tempted at this very moment to think, all right, that's it, I'm going to become more religious, I'm going to become more... I would just urge you to just, just press pause on that zeal until tonight. Come back tonight, final presentation, the faith of Jesus. And we'll see how the church... Let's justice run like a river in righteousness like a mighty cataract. That's coming. You say, ah, Jesus is my king. I want to see him face to face. Number two, I see that he may be waiting on me more than I'm waiting on him. Just ask him. If that shoe fits, you put it on and you mark that. I not only wish for his return, I choose to work for his return. Man, there's too many of us sitting on padded pews in air-conditioned buildings just ready for Jesus to come back and lay waste. Where Jesus is saying, get out of that building, get off of those pews, and go out there and bring the gospel to your community, to your family, to your neighborhood, to your sphere of influence. I know you're waiting. Knock it off with the waiting. I'm the one waiting, he's saying. Number four, I want to be baptized. Man, I tell you, if Jesus is your king and you've not been baptized, check 
I would like to receive Bible studies or more information on these things. And finally, I have a special need and I would like to help. As I mentioned last night, there's a fantastic pastoral staff in this area. I've had the privilege to get to meet some of them and know some of them. Beautiful people, godly men. And um, I just urge you, if you have a special need, a specific need that we can help you with, that the local ministers here can help you with, they would be thrilled to do so. To minister to your needs. You might be in a difficult situation emotionally or in terms of your family or whatever. If you need help, you don't, don't be afraid. Don't be so proud that you can't ask for help. If you need help, ask for it. We'd love to see if we can help. We'll do what we can, and if we, if we're, if we can't, we know the one who can. We know him. Matt and Josie are going to sing a beautiful, beautiful song. It's a song I want you to turn your attention to, and uh, I think you're really going to love it. It's called Love Never Fails. Love Never Fails. Love never fails you. 